Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to day two of a beautiful Learning from the Land series that started yesterday. Happy St. Patrick's Day. It is um, March 17th, 2021, and I am thrilled to be your host today and um, take you through a wonderful series of guest speakers from our opening with Walter Paul. Then we'll learn about uh, Wajowson Wind Project being done in partnership with Natural Forces and Tobik First Nation. Then we'll meet somebody at 11 who is actually in Tobik First Nation and was heavily involved in the environmental impact assessing uh, there before the windmill project took off. Jamie Gorman will be joining us later. And we have on the line with us this morning, Bernie Bagel from Natural Resources who will introduce us closely to the Wabanaki Forest. Then Anna Lee and her friend JP will demystify some of our wind energy myths. They're from Gaia and MB Power and we'll be blessed with a closing and some hope for the future with Blue Jay, our friend Ed Purley uh, from Tobik First Nation. So we are acknowledging um, three territories this morning. Our guest speaker, Walter is coming to us from the watershed that we are sort of hosting this event from and the Wallistaque territory. We're also um, coming to you from where I sit actually on the ancestral territory of the Mi'kmaq peoples. And you in the South could be joining us from the Passamakati territory. So welcome to you all. And I just want to remind you that uh, your mutes should be off while the presenter's speaking. And Walter, before I welcome you, I am handing you virtually a pouch of tobacco to say thank you so much for joining us this morning from uh, St. Mary's. First Nation. Yeah. Okay. So we went. We're great to have, it's just awesome to have Walter with us this morning. He's been on bright and early, raring to go. I can't help but show this beautiful picture of where he's sitting from. This is the beautiful Willistook. And Walter, when you're ready, uh, I can stop sharing and you can start sharing if you'd like. Okay. And welcome. Are you, are you going to, the air slides, are you going to show Lewis the, uh, do you want to see the dam? The dam, yeah, before and after. Oh, of course. Uh, yeah, just to give an idea. There you go. Uh, oh, that's the, yeah, yeah, the holistic stream that's coming into the, or the um, Mactaquack stream coming into the St. John River. Okay, and the thing about it is, is that I was gifted with the, uh, I was gifted and given the, the privilege to be able to see the original beauty of the Wolustuk, and Wolustuk means beautiful river, but before the, before the uh, construction of the dam, I was, I was given the opportunity to see what it actually looked like. In the first slide, it showed, uh, looks like they were the uh, Snowshoe Islands, so I've been up into that area. I've walked on those islands, but unfortunately when the dam was built, those islands are now under about 40, 50, 60 feet of water. It's flooded, eh? So, and I'll probably talk a little bit more of, um, of uh, what happens when, uh, when, we, when we lose such a site, when we lose, when we lose the island, eh? Many things happen or we lose our stories. We forget about stories eventually because we've got generations of uh, young people that exist today, non-indigenous, indigenous. And if you ask them about the um, Snowshoe Islands, they kind of look at you and say, where's that? So, you know, yeah, then you have to go into a long, <laughs> a long uh, historical talk of explaining where it's located 
and, and what the islands were, were uh, used for. But before I speak, I only have about 45 minutes. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to um, uh, prepare the uh, virtual space. And what I'm going to do is offer the four sacred plants to, um, uh, to the four directions and invite our um, Gatchik Danajik or Dulnabamak, our relations to uh, to the to the um, to this gathering, this virtual gathering. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go into the uh, the direction of the east. I'm going to do this all in a holistic way, and and when I do it in all in a holistic way, what I'm actually doing is just I'm creating a decolonized space where we could where we could feel safe, where we could feel good. And all this. So what I'll do is like I got four piles of the sacred plant, the four sacred plants in front of me. And what I'll do is first is um, what I'm going to explain to you after what I say in our language. So I will say this is Glonki Putin Dama Wichi Wulbu Jiminok Sewanik the Gwajimula got chickadinagic tuchkuyanya yud eat the Maui Yamak. Is it that we joke him coon in? They got the gag him coon in. The gadgetal yan yad look your wat look your soundusk. Lumpy pudding well ever skill. You could look your soundusk so manic. The goji more like a chicken than agic naga, dulna bamak. Touchquian, <laughs> The gets dot we at little yan Ladwasnak, Lumpki Pood and Gusko Skidlibu Ladwasnak, Chewsewanik, the Gwajimu Lag the Gatchigadanajik Tuchkuyanya Itli Itli Mami Yamak, is that we joke Kem Konen, Nagad Lil Gakim Konen. And what I just did is that I invited all our relations in four directions to this space. To the, and then to help us to learn and to help each other to get a good understanding of everything that's present presented today and that um, and that uh, hope we um, can share share the beauty of this uh, the space and in, uh, in word so I got a nice picture of you so I've moved on so I don't want to do oh sorry I forgot to share my screens. Okay. okay. I'm over there now. So I just did the opening. Yep. Yep, there we go. Okay. You're, you're a pro, Walter. No, I'm not because I'm extreme. <laughs> this is the only time I feel that I'm lost. Okay? <laughs> and I always tell my wife, say, don't make too many paths. If you make too many paths, you're surely going to get lost eh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that's happened. So, and what I'm going to do is, if I can get this through here, just a sec here, I'm trying to get the full screen. Just a sec, my technician is here. Okay. We were blessed with some Jeremy Dutcher this morning for those who were um, on a little early. Jeremy Dutcher is an award winning musician. Uh, from Tobik First Nation, and he was singing um, The River, and no doubt speaking about the Wallistic River in his music. I highly recommend you uh, check him out if you've never heard his work. He's brilliant, Wallistic way artist, musician. And also, I should give a plug for Nate Gaffney, who's also, uh, I believe, his dad's in Tobik First Nation. Oh, there. Um, but Nate Hi. is in Fredericton <laughs> and has just put out a book on the Wallistic River, The Whispers of the Wallistic. And he is a young photographer, uh, Nate Gaffney. There, I'm just putting in a couple of okay. 
recommendation. So Walter, we're all yours. Okay, it took a few minutes. I had to run to get my technicians to kind of show me the way and show me the direction to uh, to, to uh, get around this uh, virtual space. Eh? So anyway, yeah, I'll just introduce myself. My name is Walter Paul. My spirit name is Abazenta. The meaning of my spirit name is Sun Dog. And a lot of people say, what's a Sun Dog? A sun dog is that rainbow circle around the sun. And I, most likely most of you have seen this circle, this rainbow sun, that rainbow that uh, circles the sun. And my name comes, comes from that. There's a lot of long story associated with, uh, with how I got this name. And I'm not going to get into that because we're so restricted for time. I am from Ekpahag. Ekpahag is a big area and you'll, and, uh, the meaning of this place name is where the tide water ends. And, and what happens is when the Bay of Fundy tide water raises the tide, when in a high tide, the water from that bay comes right up to this, right up to this area and right up into Silverwood area. And it's called, uh, that's what it's called, we call it the, uh, my ancestors are called Ekpahag. So there's a mixture of salt and fresh water uh, within this whole area, uh, all the way down to St. John. And there's a mixture of fish in there. You have saltwater species, you got freshwater species. It's a large land area covering approximately about 800 acres. That's, I put a little number to it, 800, about 800. And it covers all of the city of Fredericton, Lincoln, Barkers Point, Nashwalks, Douglas, Island View, Keswick, Magnaquack, and Kingslayer. So it covers a big, Area. When we say Ekbog, I'm talking about this whole area. All that. If you're familiar with the Fredericton area, you know all of these uh, outskirts or little town sites that are around the city of Fredericton. It's a huge, huge area. And it's always been used by my ancestors, and it's still being used occasionally by the Wolstigary people that uh, gather around these islands. And we're getting close to that time period now because in May, that's when uh, our ancestors, ancestors got together and gathered around this place called Ekbahag, and we call it Udanek. But I was going to provide all of the um, uh, Wolustig with names for all of these areas. But we'll look, if we have time at the end, then I'll explain to you all of these areas that fit into this area, this one area that we call Ekbahag. Eh? The picture that I just, I love to share is this one here. Mm. This is this is this is a beautiful picture. I've been given several opportunities or and gifted with uh, the chance to come upon such an event that's taking place, eh? And uh, you can walk right up to this to this uh, to this pond. And the fawn will not move unless you're actually going to step on it. Then they'll jump up and away. But generally, they'll lay there, and you can walk almost right up to it and just look into that into their uh, area where they're where they're um, laid out, where the mother had uh, put them in. She, the mother, makes the space. The young one is put in there, and then the mother goes off to a different area, either to feed or to do other things. As she goes around these and there, and basically just tells them. You do not move. You don't. You stay where you are, and they stay there, no matter what. They'll stay in that one spot. And what I want to share with you is that if you look at uh, the young, on uh, the young there, but what I want to demonstrate to you is that at initial contact, what happened was the perception of the Wolastigari people, the Mi'kmaq people, that we were. Uh, we're, we were uh, primitive, uh, uh, we were pagans, we were eagans, unintelligent, and uh, that, um, but when you look at a picture like this, it shows you the complexity of their, uh, of what they were, of what my ancestors were thinking. Was this we know? If you look at these words, the first word you see, this one here, it says, was this we know? And this is just another word for womb. A womb where we all were in the, our mother's womb and we were born. And if you look at the young 
the young fawn is curled up in this particular space in a circular motion. And I could say, I'm safe to say that 100% of the time, the deer will lay in this space in a clockwise direction. The young fawn is in clockwise direction. And it takes a particular, it's, it, uh, it's in a, um, a position that we call put, put kohojin, put kohojin, this means uh, it's in a fetal position because while we're in our mother's womb before birth, we're in what we call a fetal position. And this young one, this young fawn is in the fetal position, is in the womb of, of, of the mother earth. And always, L, which is the female deer, she, she will make it, this will be constructed in the sunlight, right? Not in the shadows, but it's, it's out in the opening in the sunlight and it creates warmth for the young fawn. The young fawn feels safe and secure, right? That nothing's gonna harm her. And then the young fawn will not move from that position until such time that the mother returns and says, okay, Time to um, time to move on. I'm back, and, and the young fawn will get up. But like I said, several times in my lifetime, I've been able to see this kind of event taking place, and to get an understanding of it, of what what uh, our people, my ancestors, and even today, some of our some of our Wolastigari people, and even some of uh, the non-indigenous people, get an understanding of what's going on in this event. It's a young fawn that is in that position. Okay? But it's just to kind of demonstrate you that our people, my ancestors were very complex thinkers. And they had words for such an event like, was this we know which means fetal position, the warm. The one means when the mother makes the bed, she's making a bed, a bed for the, uh, the young fawn to. Um, to to, um, what, to crawl into and to and to and to sit there and or to lay there until that time, but anyway, so it's interesting that uh, as we go through this uh, presentation, we had words for for such events, and I'll be talking a little bit more about that. So now this one here, this third slide is uh, about the area that uh, I refer to as Ekpahag. There's a mountain, you could go to the city, uh, the Fredericton, in Fredericton City Bridge, and you could look up the river, look to the, look up river, and you could see that mountain sticking out. It's called uh, Curry Mountain, but in our language, we called it, my ancestors called it Budwau, so we were just, which just means Little Council Mountain. And then what we're going to do is we're going to look at the story, I'll talk a little bit about the story. All of the islands here, there's a string of islands. Up a little further, up river, is the island that was on the uh, on the screen, which uh, kind of show what they call snowshoe islands. But this was my main classroom, right here. This whole area was my teaching area. This is my classroom. This is where I learned a lot of my language. I learned a lot of the uh, traditions, life skills, I learned it all right here on these islands. And um, I would get into talking more about this, but like I say, it's uh, like at the time, it's kind of, we're restricted for time. I'll quickly name the islands for you. And uh, this island here is, we, we call it Nukam uh, Kijawuk Munik, which is Keswick Island. These names were taught to me when I was young, 10, 11, 12, whatever. And I learned, I learned them from my, from my parents, from my uncles, my and community members. This one we call Zugal Island. And uh, in English, it almost sounds the same as Sugar Island. This is Ekbahag Island. Unfortunately, what happened at, at contact, shortly after contact, it was referred to as Savage Island. About, eh, about seven, eight years ago, maybe more, the name was changed and it was changed to Ekbahag Island. Savage Island is stricken off the books and we call it Ekbahag Island now. This is the island that my family lived on right here. 
and I've camped on there and I've stayed on there two months out of the year on this island. And it's Kagagu Oden. And all that means is a doorway. Means this is the doorway to this island. Because in the story, you're going to see that uh, there was a village at the foot of this mountain, but things happened, environmental changes happened, and then eventually, the uh, village Odan, we called it Odanic, it was it moved over to the island, and on this island is on this side is the uh, what we call nobody camps there, but there's two families that stayed on this side of the island, which is the uh, south side, and over this the north side. Most of your people that went up into the islands, and even today, if there's still uh, survivors within that family. They camped along this whole area, stayed on this, the north side of the island. And then on the south side, there was only a couple of families. There's, there's a lot of stories that we could talk about regarding these families. Then we have Bakaluks, Bogaluks Manik, uh, Zips Manik. So these islands, I know the names of, and there's more islands down in this area. But I'm not going to go into talking about them because uh, well, there's names for them too, I know those. But I was taught all of this whole area and it became my classroom and it became my, a place where I learned all about my uh, values, my traditions, my, uh, my uh, language, especially my language. Because you'll see what happens when the river changed, the river, when the dam was built in 1962 and things have started to happen, the things change for these islands. And when the islands change, right, our people kind of uh, moved away from going up into the islands. There's the occasional visit today, but a lot of our, uh, about a lot of our ancestors kind of, the connection changed. And when that happened, our language began to change, our traditions, our values, our customs, everything. So we'll move on. So that honor, keep that on this island in mind, the mountain, eh? And I'll explain to you is that this is where, before contact, this was where my ancestors had come to. And surrounding this, this whole area, this surrounding this whole area called Ekbahag, there's four springs that exist, two on the north side, one at the foot of this mountain, but well, we were just as, and then further, just further up to what they call Hillcrest Farm, there's another one there. Then across the river, directly across is another spring. And then right down here at this Hearts Island, they call it across, is another spring. So accessibility to the cool, clear, spring water was there for our people because when our people moved into this area they didn't come down for a week or two but they come there for five months six months of the year and so half of the year was spent on these islands uh, and uh, and the reason why they moved was because moved into this area and i believe is because of the springs see our earned the willista what happens is that once 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 it gets warm, right, and gets hot, the water becomes kind of stale or stagnant, or right? it happens because of heat. It happens to a lot of the uh, even spring-fed streams that are up uh, that are in areas that are uh, they can become stagnant. So I guess the use the consumption of the water narrows down. But they had the springs that four springs that were always in flow. If you went up there today, you probably most likely you'd be able to have access or be able to gain the spring water to go. Anyway, so, ah, now here we go. This is the story about Budwausu in Wajisit, the story of that mountain, right? Um, my vision is bad right now in this here. So and sometimes I'll miss the word or whatever as I'm reading through. But you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to ask Pam. If she would read. Um, Pam would read this story for me. And then and I'll talk more about it after. Pam, you don't mind reading it. I'd be her. honored. 
Yeah, okay, great. Long before the arrival of the newcomers, the Wallistaquay people lived at the base of Curry Mountain, which is known in the past and today as Putumawusi, Wakusis, meaning Wukus. Little Council <laughs> Mountain. Oh, I killed it, didn't I? Oh, that's okay. Sound about, good. Okay. You chime in with the Wallistic um, pronunciation when when I trip over the Okay, language. I'll pronounce this for the uh, the listeners. But also we would just sis. Perfect. Yeah, that's how, yeah, that's how we say them. <laughs> Wait, carry on. Okay. No also, it is understood that this mountain is a dormant volcano approximately 350 million years old. Sorry, I have to admit somebody. The name mm. of the village at the base of Putuusi. Putuusi, would just this is called Utenek, Ode Odanek, which means village. The larger geographical area is called Ekpoktok. Ekpahog. Ekpahog, meaning where the tide water ends. The valley nourished the people so well that they became unmindful of their good fortune. The people forgot about the original instructions and the ways that the mountain, the river, the plants, the birds, and the animals had taught them. Gluskop. Yeah. Gizilkun. Gizilkun. Yeah. And Muen were standing at the summit of. But who else we were just this? where they were able to get a good view of the village below. Muen could sense that Gluskop Gizil, was not happy with the people because of their waywardness. Gluskop Giz, instructed Muen to go down to the village and to warn the people to return to the original teachings. Muen slowly descended the mountain. Upon reaching the village, Muin spoke to the people regarding Gluskop's displeasure and anger. The people ignored Muin's warnings. Yeah. Muin returned to the summit to tell Gluskop of the people's refusal to listen. Gluskop which is shouted and demanded Muin go back down to that village the village, and tell the people to return to the original instructions. Finally, Muin got so angry that he came roaring down from the top of the mountain. Black bears, which is what Muin is, running yeah. uphill are breathtakingly fast. But because their front legs are short, black bears sometimes slide and tumble coming downhill. And Muin brought half the mountain with him. Sticks, trees, rocks, roots, moss, dirt covering the valley floor and the village. Several islands were formed on the beautiful river. Many of the people were covered. Those who were out berry picking, collecting duck eggs, hunting, trapping for muskrat and gathering survived. This is about 5,000 years ago. Over time, the people returned to the village to rebuild. The village was rebuilt on an island, which is located at the base of the newcomers had named the island Savage Island. Just recently, the Wallistic people renamed Savage Island to Ekpahak, Monik yeah. Island. Yeah. Now, this story, this story uh, I heard all oh, in my younger days. And, and what it was told to me by my father and my uncle, and I've heard it from other, other families that uh, resided or dwelled on those islands. And they went there for uh, economic reasons. They went either there went picking fiddlets, they went there picking nuts, or they went up there to uh, seek out what they call white, black ash to make baskets, to make battles, axe handles. And the people went up there for, uh, for those economic reasons. But they also had a very sacred and spiritual connection with those, with the island and with the mountain. Eh? If you, if, when you look at the story, what's going on is that the island, when Muin, when Gluskap sees and gets upset with the people, the people were, 
we're moving away from the original study or uh, original instructions. And what they were doing, were they were ignoring ceremonies. They were ignoring uh, a good way of living. Or, because we're human beings, unfortunately, that when things are going good, we tend to forget. When things are going just right and good, we have a tendency to forget, right? And I believe in this story, that happened to our people because things were really going good. And they tend to, to tend to forget and say, oh, we don't have to connect with uh, Glooscap and, uh, or Moen or whatever. We'll just continue on living. Glooscap gets upset. And when he gets upset, what happened was uh, he says to Moen, you go down. You go down and warn the people to come back to the original instructions, the original teachings. And Moen did that. He did it twice. He went down the first time, they didn't listen, came back. And Glooscap was upset and to told in a harsh way to told Moen to go back down. Moen goes down. And that's the thing about bears, the story tells that they're that they run fast uphill, side hill, but when they run down, they're, 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 they have a rough go at it. Eh? And we have a word for that we call Jadumia. And in Maliseet, that's what happens when they run downhill. Jadumia. In other words, the way I could explain it is that they fall forward, they trip. And when that happened, Moen took all, all of the rocks and trees with, with him. And what happened at the bottom, the village was at the bottom of, of uh, Burwoswi Wood Justice or Curry, Curry Mountain. It was covered and people that were there, unfortunately, were buried with the village. Others were fortunate, enough, fortunate because they were out doing other things. They're picking berries or they were collecting duck eggs or hunting, trapping, whatever, eh? But years later, what happened is that they came to this area. Penge came back to this area. Excuse me. <clears throat> when they came back into this area, they saw that the village was covered, right? A lot of their relatives were, were no longer with them. So they rebuilt and they rebuilt it on that island that they call Ekbog Island. And initially it was called Savage Island. Ekpahag Island, and the, and it was uh, before contact. It was called Udanek, the village. Eh? Eh? And what happened was, uh, you got to think of what was going on. Remember, the story said that it was a dormant volcano. It wasn't active, but they were there in a time when it was active, when there was eruptions taking place when there was lava coming out and it was flowing down the side of the mountain into the rivers. And what they see was the formation of land taking place. The islands, all 10 islands along that stretch, below the mountain started to be formed and they were formed. So what our, um, what my ancestors were watching was creation taking place. So that's a long time that my ancestors have been in this area a long time that the Wolustagari people were here to see something being created and the land was being created and being formed. So it, it tells a long time. The bear, you have to remember, was the lava. The bear symbolized lava taking place during an eruption of lava flowing down the mountain into the rivers. And that's how, basically, if you look at it, if you look at it archeologically, that's how a lot of, many of the islands were, were formed, the Hawaiian islands or any other islands, it's all formed by volcanoes and lava forming that whole area. So, and that's, and I believe this is what was happening here. Just to back up a little bit, um, 1952, we'll see, we're gonna look at, the truth behind this story. Eh? We know it's true because it talks about the islands, it talked about the mountain, it talked about what was here before contact. But in 1952, I believe in 52, that they built a railway. There used to, it's a walking trail now, but that was once railway tracks. We called a guzz out, eh? and it was railway tracks that were formed. And when the railway tracks were formed, when it was established, when they were constructed, they ran across artifacts. They weren't burial items, but items 
that were used in everyday use, which tells us that there was a village right at the foot of that mountain because the, the uh, railway tracks move along there. And recently what they've done is doing re road repairs. I'm surprised that they didn't uh, mention it, but while they're doing road repairs on that, on that highway beside the tracks, at the foot of the mountain, again, they found some artifacts. And these artifacts were like uh, artifacts that were used in everyday use and everyday survival, right? So that kind of shows to me that, wow, this story does tell a lot. It tells us about the village and the, and the, and the findings 50, 60 years ago of artifacts to say that people lived along there. Kind of indicates to us that uh, what our people were seeing, what was happening around, around that area. So that's what I, I just wanted to do a quick, um, a quick, just a quick review of the story and to give you some indication of what was going on in that particular area. You have to remember that six months of the year, our people lived in that area on those islands, right? Mm -hmm. And the other six months of it, they spent, they were split up into winter months and moved to their family hunting grounds because it was easier during the winter months for a group of people in small families, units to survive than in a large one like in Ekbog, it would be difficult. So there's a lot of beautiful history involved in this whole area. And then again, I was given that gift, that opportunity to hear this story, that I would able to share this story today. Not too many people are aware of this story. Right? I shared this story with you as was told to me in in my uh, in my younger days, because there are similar stories among the uh, uh, Anishinaabe people, the Ojibwe Cree people. They have a similar story, and similar story out, out among the Balakula and BC and the Kwakutl. They have a similar story. So there are similar stories all the way across Canada about creation, about villages, how they were formed. Hmm, okay. Locations. Manikweko just means islands. These are some of the names of those islands I think I shared with you quickly. First one is Kagagi Oden. That's Hearts Island. Ekpahag, Ekpahag Island. The one that was originally called uh, Odenek or uh, Savage Island. As if this way, Manik is birds, Bird Island. Wagaluks. Buckalux, it's called, it's, and it's in English, it's called, it's still called Parsnip Island today. Nukam Kijuak, that's a good word. Oh, I, I like that word sound. It's, it's Keswick. That's Keswick Island. Amsquasawe um, is the first island. Nizawe is the second island. So these are, uh, well, it's the great names of those islands. You can see first island just uh, maybe about three, two or three miles up. You can see the first one, and then it follows along and goes along. They're pretty well all in order, the islands. Loss of language occurs when there is a decreased relationship or connection with the islands and the mountain. A lack of memory environment, a lack of memory environment created a threat to the gray uh, identity. So in other words, uh, eventually because of the things that, that are listed below, our relationship, our connection with the uh, island changed. Our, our rela uh, relationships, uh, uh, you know, uh, we're, we're, we're weakened because we, we were not um, going up into that area, you know, anymore, or our uh, connection was restricted or limited. What happened was Indian reservations were established which was resulted into relocations. So in other words, some of our ancestors are, that were living on the islands or Indian reservations were collected. There are six of them along the St. John or the Willistic River, all the way up from where or to St. Mary's, Kingsclair, Woodstock, Medawas, Keg, uh, Perth, Andover. The reserves were created, established, and people, our people were relocated onto the force, well, say forcibly relocated onto these 
little strips of land, right? Land was privatized and used as places for, I put cows to graze because that's interesting, is that those islands were privatized and were taken over by uh, farmers within the whole, within that, within the, from the surrounding areas. And, and, they, um, and what happened was that uh, it became farmland and cows were one of the uh, animals that were, sh were, uh, were booted over to the island and they were released to grow uh, on, on those islands. Eh? And they stayed within there. It was just the natural boundaries so that uh, you see a natural, you see the boundaries in a cow pasture is a fence, but the Willowstook acted as a fence to keep cows in one area, which is those islands. And what happened was cows, great big hoofs on them. So what they did was when they traveled around the land, around the island, there those big big hopes uprooted a lot of the uh, the fiddlehead plants. They're a clump. I wish I should have provided a picture of it, but a clump of them. And what the what the cows were doing was they when they walked, it would wander and they would rip up all of these fiddlehead plants. Right? That 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 kind of reduced a traditional food, and when that reduced things also begin to reduce. The land was reduced uh, and our culture identity began to become reduced. Our language even was getting reduced. Eh? The renaming of islands by newcomers when they arrived here. And when they arrived here, the, our relationship was further further diminished because they didn't use the, um, what's the way names? They call the first island, second island. Uh, uh, Bird Island, Heart Island, Savage Island, Sugar Island, Keswick Island. So our na the names of those islands changed. And when the names changed, so did our language, so did our relationship, so did our connection. That that it's still even impact and has, has an impact upon uh, the Worcester Gray people today. Right? Magna Quack Dam has changed the landscape. Even though the landscape changed, the shores remain. That happened when the dam formed. The, the land, even though it changed, the stories for these areas stayed with us for a while. But eventually they were forgotten, like the Snowshoe Islands. Chimoin, which is Great Bear, changed. A lot of our, our burial sites were flooded. The islands, uh, the camp sites, are, are, like I said, our burial sites were all flooded when the dam was constructed and, and water back flowed. So it, the, the backflow goes all the way 60 miles back, probably, uh, to Woodstock and even further back into, into uh, Heartland or whatever. Right? Well, let's take a words associated with the sacred area. And to me, this Ekpahag is a sacred area very meaningful for me eh? because of the fact that my identity is still connected to that area even though there has been changes i still am connected to the area and the words associated with that with that particular area are seldom spoken when you lose land-based practice and traditions you lose language we lost fiddle picking because of the cows right and because it was privatized land, we were not able to go in to cut uh, the white and uh, black ash to make baskets. Our ec economic economy was changed. Eh? And, and because of that change, words associated with basket making were lost because our people were not as involved as before into making baskets, battles, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, whatever. And, uh, and you know, just a quick review of... Uh, like I'm saying that when our language changed because of reduction in land, the economy changed, everything, the river itself, it's changed the flows. Our, our practices for our bone in uh, salmon and bass changed because of uh, the spawning grounds of the salmon and, and the striped bass, the sea bass, were, uh, were, uh, they disappeared, they became sandbars. Right, so that's that's the whole complete story of that ac activity because none of our people now go and harpoon. 
I think in 1962 was the last time that a group of us went up there and harpooned uh, striped bass. I think my, and I was the last one, the last at 12 and 13 or 13, last one to take a, a, a striped bass out of the spawning ground of, of the uh, sea bass. And, got, and the spawning ground is gone. Where they went to, we don't know. They went, some say they went out into Great Lake or Grand Lake. So when you lose natural resources, you, you lose your way of life, land-based practices, traditions. Uh, uh, pick and even, pick and even uh, what they call butternuts. Grapes, that area was always loaded with grapes. You pick grapes. We used to be able to go and pick up uh, butternuts. Right? And we had all sorts of different fish, but it all changed. And then somehow our way of life was diminished and we lost connection, say. This is where I, I, all of this, I've been caught up with relocation, privatization of land, eh? the loss of traditions. Eh? But the biggest thing was that the Indian day schools, Indian residential schools, which was forced assimilation of our children because I attended Indian day schools. I was lucky not to have been sent to an Indian residential school, but I went to an Indian day school. And those had an impact upon several generations of uh, of our people that went to these schools and because they were forced and they lost their language they lost their a lot of their of, um, traditions values customs eh? so and in in day schools and it took it took it took away a lot wave a lot from me that when I uh, that it took me a long way a lot to come back to to uh, learn about who I am and uh, learn about my culture and learn my language. So those are the things that happened to that particular area, all the way up to Saint, to the uh, all the way up to Saint John River. These things happened, all right? Well, just can give... I just interrupt sure. you for two seconds? I right on. Don't want you to stop. I don't. I uh, so appreciate your um, environment as your classroom and that's just resonating with me and how the land and the earth can teach us so much more than ecology, but mm. language, culture, history, economy, you name it. I just want to say that the bell, we're following Southern Victoria's bell <sighs> schedule. And if students and classes need to shift please feel free to do so. Walter, we have um, sort of bedded in a little bit of a break between you and session two. Mm -hmm. So you are welcome and I hope you do continue. Just know that some may have to pop off and go to class. Um, if you can't, if you can stay on, uh, Walter will sort of segue into the next speaker, I hope with his Wu Jowson story. Oh, um, that's it. Yes, please. You're uh, welcome to do that. So I'm, I'm going to stop talking. Walter, you continue and uh, just know that if, if people leave, it's because the bell's ringing um, to end class. Okay. All I'll right. Just mute Great. It. Thanks. Thank okay. I'll just move on to the next slide quickly. Now, this is what I was saying regarding when, when your relationship and, and when your connection with the land changes. Eh? For me, it was the islands. For me, it was the uh, Willowstook River, the St. John Adventure. And eventually what it became was just a memory. And then what happens was the memory becomes lost. And that's what's happening to a few of a generation of us is that we no longer have a memory of those islands or, or that or... Um, or what was taking place and how important it was for uh, for the Willistigary people. Just to give you an idea is some of the words that can only be used up in that area. That's the time when we we uh, we, we use these words like Aguiden, uh, uh, which just means canoe, right? We traveled around. Tahogan, paddle. Get Bidjuwuk, that's the narrow between two islands. Nolamuk is upriver. Bapgeu is downriver. Melawi Zogu, 
paddles away from shore. Ogle look, skunk cabbage, medicine, and it's a dressing because of the, because of one time there I had cut myself with a knife when I was cutting fiddleheads and my mother, my mother walked over to what they call skunk cabbage and she ripped off a huge leaf and wrapped it around my hand. And she said, keep that on for a day. And it was like a uh, uh, bandage that she put on over the cut. And within a day or so, felt better, started healing. Elie is the coves, because in those islands, I've never seen so many so many coves, or what in my language you call Elie Vizabek. And, and this is how we, uh, our ancestors measure distance, right? On every island, there is what they call Elie Vizabek. Every island has one, right? And if we, we're moving from one island. I can remember at 10 years old, 11 years old, when my uncle would say, because you know, now Jim Kanasnil want Zogel, Zogel Manikuk, Nami Ochil, Eli Bizekek. In other words, he said, I'm going to go pick on Sugar Island and I'll see you at the Cove. We knew, and right away, my father would know where what he was talking about, the area he was talking about, right? We didn't say it in miles or yards or feet or whatever. We just, we we understood the distance by looking at different uh, inlets, all the way from St. John, all the way to, uh, we'll say, Kingster. They used to do that, is measure the distance between how many coves that is there between St. John City and uh, what uh, Kingster. And if I said, I will see you on the sixth cove. Instead of saying, I'll see you 30 miles away, I'll be 30 miles away, it's by the coves. And they would count the coves, right? Instead of using miles. Uh, not, uh, not the gahazu, right? This word could only be used only if you're on a canoe. Not the gahazu. And and so that activity, that tradition or or custom, is 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 uh, that word is forgotten. It's not used now because of the fact that our people are not connected with that space, and uh, and because of it, they don't use these words. And these words become a memory, and then eventually the memory is lost. Most of these most of these words are no longer used. I remember them because of the fact that I had to go back and really think hard about them and, and uh, bring them forward to the, to do uh, today and to, to know these, uh, to these, to know these words. So you see what's, you can see what's happening is because of the fact my language, I learned my language right here because of my connection with the river and the islands in my younger days, and I was able to maintain maintain my language until Indian residential schools. And I went to the public school system where my language wasn't offered and my connection with my community and people was very limited that we began to lose these words. Uh, we're now there. <laughs> <laughs> Again, I don't want to say, uh, ask you to read this, but I'll do, I guess I'll just say, you say the English and I'll say the Willis degree. Can you read it for me, Pam? I would be honored. Oh, thank you. Well, my ancestors lived in a village called Utenek. Udenek. Udenek. Uh-huh. Which was located in Akpahak. Right on. Monik. Island. Monique. Island. Across from Curry Mountain. Mm -hmm. The village was located on the highest part of the island so that the tide water and spring flood water could not reach them. Further up river, another mountain called Mount Carlton can be seen. Great wind bird lived on the top of this mountain. The people called great wind bird who controlled the wind Wojowson. Every time Wojowson's wings flapped, a strong wind would blow. I love this. Mm. One day, Gluskop. Oh, yeah, okay. Gizil. <laughs> went among the people. 
Upon arriving at the village, the people complained that they were unable to do their daily activities. The people were unable to hunt, to fish, to gather, and to travel because of the strong wind. So, yeah. call to the people. Wajowson has done this. I will paddle to Mount Carlton and find Great Winged Bird. Glouse Cap. Was it was Gazeal Gazeolkun? Paddled toward the mountain and found Wojowson sitting on the top of Mount Carlton, flapping both wings. Glooskap Gazeolkun shouted to Great Windbird, Windblower, please have pity on the people for they are unable to hunt, to fish, to gather, or travel because of the strong wind you are creating. Glooskap. Gizyolkun grabbed Wojowson and tied both wings, then placed Great Windbird between two rocks and left Wojowson lying there. The people were able to go out in their canoes to hunt, to fish, to gather, and travel. The wind was calm for many days, and with all the rivers, streams, and lakes became stagnant and yucky. The people were unable to travel and to drink the water. Even Glooskap was not able to drink from the paddle or from and paddle in the streams, lakes, and rivers. So Glooskap, sorry. Then, Gizyolkun, yeah. <laughs> okay. Then thought of Great Windbird. Again, Glooskop paddled to Mount Carlton and found Wojowson lying between two big rocks. Glooskop <laughs> raised and placed the great wind bird on a huge rock and untied one wing. Since then, the winds have never been so terrible as in the olden days. The rivers, the springs, the lakes and the streams were no longer stagnant and yucky, but they were fresh, sweet, and cool. Right on. And, and, and this story is important to us. Here's, here's the kicker is Mount Carlton, right? I don't know, I can't remember the name of, of that mountain in my language. I can't remember it. But maybe someone from Perth Andover or from uh, Negotikog or Tubik uh, uh, will be able to share that with you. So I have had to use Mount Carlton. It's it's interesting that when we first started about the uh, the wind project that they have mm -hmm. that's going on, I see that I when I first thing when I looked read read about it and and looked at the. Uh, the the windmills that are up on the hill there and the movement going on and the first thing i thought of was the spirit of wajowson mm -hmm. how my people had understood wind how important it was or it is still is very important to the environment because without wind there would be no move there would be no movement of the waters and that and a wind what it does is it keeps the water moving around so that it doesn't stagnate too much and uh and you know and become stale and stagnant thing mm -hmm. but and the wind helps that movement helps that river to movement because you have to remember on the earth there's always um movement going on there's something always taking place there's always wind there's the rivers there's the animals there's movement it's never still it's always moving yeah. right yeah the earth moves all the time yeah. right mm -hmm. but this story i had to put the story in because of the wind project how our people understood the wind right mm -hmm. and how our people are are uh, understanding it today Indigenous and non-Indigenous, how they understand the importance of wind. And I, I myself see the spirit of Wajowson in that project that's going on, which creates the wind, which creates uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, 
you know, helps the people to survive, mm -hmm. right? That is going on because it provides electricity, provides, um, you know, that air movement. So this story shares and tells a lot. And it goes on. And the name of the project and the name of the project is Wajosin. I know. Yeah. It's fantastic. And if you stick around, Walter and, and guests, you'll see uh, some beautiful uh, pictures of mm. those turbines and some of the Willistiquay art that's on them. But I, I don't want to spoil the presentation. And mm. uh, it's perfect timing. Perfect time. Yeah. You've segued in beautifully to uh, Natural Forces Talk, which will start yeah. at 940. So we'll we'll take a 10 minute break. I'll play some more Jeremy Dutcher. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Jamie Gorman will join us from Tobik First Nation to, to talk a, a little bit about um, his community and their involvement with uh, the Wajowson project. So Walter, mm -hmm. please accept our gratitude for opening for us this morning. It was a distinct pleasure. I'm going to stop recording and just, if people would like to shout out uh, to Walter, he can see it in the chat or 